Next, the House Oversight Committee examines a recent audit of internal House operations. The House authorized the audit, which covers the period of October 1993 to December 94. It was conducted by Price Waterhouse at a cost of more than $3 million. We begin with Republican Congressman Bill Thomas of California, Chairman of the House Committee on Government Reform and Oversight. House Oversight Committee uh, will come to order. It's, uh, it's a pleasure this morning to uh, reach another milestone in uh, the new Republican majority's agreement to make some promises and then actually keep them. Uh, on opening day, uh, among a number of items, was, of course, the vote to have a first-ever independent professional audit of the House of Representatives. As you might expect, it passed almost unanimously. I believe the vote was 430 to 1. Uh, there is no uh, major significance to the overwhelming vote. I mean, how could you vote against an independent audit uh, of the House? What was unprecedented, of course, was the fact that the resolution was before the House to do so. Uh, and that took a new majority uh, to bring it about. Uh, I was the ranking minority member of the predecessor of this House Oversight Committee, the Committee on House Administration. And as a member, uh, I was pretty much aware in running my office and using House services uh, how inadequate the system was for the volume of transactions that were handled, more than $700 million in taxpayers' dollars, more than 500,000 transactions annually. I was also aware of significant waste, <coughs> patronage, partisanship, and the way in which decisions were made not only in the finance office, but by the process of exceptions under the chairman of House administration, to the point that, frankly, exceptions were the rule rather than the rules that were in the handbook. During my tenure as ranking minority member, I was relatively vehement in my criticism of the system. Uh, for the record, uh, without objection, I'd like to submit an August 18, 1994 letter to Bob Michael as the most recent example when we were in the minority <coughs> of our concerns. It in part reads, um, dear Bob, I want to bring to your attention an issue which I have spent the last two months investigating with the invaluable assistance of Congressman Bill Klinger, who is now the chairman of the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, and now feel confident in stating my concerns and asking for your assistance. As you know, the GAO audits the Finance Office, quote, statement of accountability, close quote, annually. This is the only audit of any sort done of the Finance Office. And other than audits of the revolving funds, no other financial reconciliation other than budgetary takes place. In June, I learned the GAO has requested but been denied access by the Democrats on the Committee on House Administration to the computer systems in the Finance Office as a part of the annual audit. My immediate concern, of course, was how can GAO issue an audit opinion when the computers and the data stored on them are not reviewed. GAO has responded, the letter goes on to state, from August 18, 1994. GAO has responded to this concern by stating that the Office of Finance keeps two sets of books. One set is manual, the other stored on the computer system. GAO states that it is not necessary <coughs> to review the computer records to issue an audit opinion because the opinion encompasses the manual records only the manual and automated data are not reconciled. The letter goes on to say that I know you support full accountability and disclosure of House finances and share my belief that GAO audit should be reliable and have integrity. At this time, based on what I have learned, there is no such assurance of reliability and I lack confidence in GAO's work. I then go on to state that 
a statement of accountability and a performance audit type review of the process and procedures in the finance office, including the computer systems, would serve as the backbone for its operations funding and an independent review is probably necessary. I talk about the possibility of having the Inspector General do the job, but realize that an audit is needed, particularly now that we have knowledge of House Administration's reluctance to allow GAO to review any portion of the HIS computer system that operate the Finance Office. I hesitate to ask GAO to perform such an audit given their track record in the Finance Office. However, this may be our only option. And the letter goes on with additional findings. That is a letter written by a member of the minority looking at what meager resources might be available to prove that, in fact, we needed an independent audit. On January 4th, as a member of the majority, as I said, it was a pleasure to vote for a resolution which called for an independent audit. From the outset of the audit process in January, we said what we were looking for, which of course was unprecedented, was a bipartisan, independent, professional audit process. I'm very pleased to say that, of course, it is unprecedented. It has been unprecedentedly bipartisan. For more than four months, staff and myself as chairman and the ranking member were uh, apprised periodically of the work product in progress. And for that more than four months, save one particular instance of uh, uh, unusual enterprise on the part of one reporter, uh, there was no information uh, uh, made available prior to uh, basically uh, today's hearing. Uh, I believe that the audit was completely independent. Uh, people can make their own judgment based upon the testimony of the firm which was hired by the uh, Inspector General and examine the work product that will be given to every member uh, between uh, noon and 12 today and available to uh, everyone over the Internet uh, and the limited copies of the final document. Once you see the size of it, you'll understand why it won't be uh, uh, as readily available as perhaps uh, every American would like it to be, but certainly anyone who has an interest will be able to uh, know completely of what's in that process. Uh, adding to the bipartisan, independent, professional operation, today's hearing indicates that we are underscoring another commitment of this new majority, and that is transparency. In the past, information about this, the way this place was run was not only withheld from the American people and the minority, but it was, to a certain extent, withheld even to members of the majority party. What you have today is an unprecedented hearing releasing all of the information we have available to us, to the American public, at the same time that it's being released to members of the House of Representatives. You will find that it is not completely conclusive, despite our desire to make it so. And there will be subsequent actions taken on a bipartisan basis by leadership for a resolution to bring to a conclusion uh, any uh, <coughs> areas or findings that are not completely uh, reconciled in this particular uh, audit. Uh, we have instituted many reforms. Uh, you will find out, for example, uh, unfortunately, that, uh, as in the past, Congress had ordered the federal government to go to an accrual system of accounting back in 1956, did not take its own advice, uh, and in fact, on opening day, we required Congress to come under a number of laws that apply to all Americans. This audit underscores the fact that we as a House are also going to place ourselves under the same laws that we require other branches of the federal government to operate under as well. I look forward to the information we're going to receive today. Uh, it has been a long and difficult process to tell people to be patient. Uh, we will deliver on our promises. Uh, and it's a pleasure to look uh, uh, at today uh, and this hearing as the closing of uh, the first chapter uh, in our promises that began with a series of unprecedented votes on opening day and we'll only conclude 
when we have uh, completely uh, analyzed, accepted, and make changes based upon uh, this audit and subsequent audits by the Inspector General. It's a real pleasure that today has finally come. Uh, and with that, I'll turn to uh, my colleague, the gentleman from California, Mr. Fazio, uh, the ranking member, uh, who has, uh, I believe, based upon the fact that they ran the place uh, during the period in which the audit has taken place, uh, been extremely professional in the way in which he and his staff has conducted themselves. Well, first of all, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the bipartisan manner in which you and I have been able to work with the people before us in conducting this very important audit. I want to welcome both Inspector General John Lehnert and the Price Waterhouse engagement partner, Tom Crerin. And I say on behalf of all the members of this committee, we do appreciate the dispatch with which both you gentlemen have undertaken this audit. For some time now, there's been a growing sense of the need for better management of the business operations of the House. We've seen criticism of these business operations even as they were being annually audited by the GAO. But in retrospect, it's clear that while the public and private sectors have been evolving better financial management systems and control tools, the House has been falling behind in terms of its business management practices. So Democrats welcome this opportunity for change, and we intend to join the new leadership to ensure that the change is an improvement over the past. Ultimately, taxpayers deserve the best business operating systems our experts can devise. And this will require the House to follow the recommendations of the IG and the independent auditors, both now and in the future, and replace outdated business practices with modern ones. It means greater use of computers to track and analyze congressional expenditures, and more timely disclosure. The more information we can provide to the public and to the press, the more accountable the House will be to the people whom we represent. Greater access to timely information about the business operations of the House will help rebuild the public's trust, which has been eroded in recent years by incessant Congress bashing. This public negativism has been a great disservice to the country as well as to the government whose sole purpose is to facilitate the business of the American people. The House has invested over three million dollars in this audit. It's merely a down payment on a better, more accountable House. And it's a pointer giving some general and some specific directions to follow. How the House implements the audit's proposals will be a measure of how serious we are about accountability. So I encourage the public and the press to watch the House closely and to keep track of this modernization effort. It would be a shame and a poor investment of tax dollars if the House simply replaces one business process with another without accounting for a genuine improvement in our operations and management of the House. One of the principal suggestions which I understand is essential to greater accountability is moving from an antiquated cash accounting system to a more modern one used in both the private and public sectors. Moving from a system that operates like a family checkbook to a system that operates like an electronic debit card will give the House more timely information on expenditures by members. And it will likely provide greater opportunity for fiscal control in the appropriations process. I've long sought such a change. As I understand this recommendation, the House should convert to an accrual system of accounting to replace the current reimbursement system. Since this will be consistent with the executive branch and the private sector, the House will then truly be able to say that it is operating on the same basis as everyone else. We will then be in general following acceptable accounting standards as prescribed by the accounting profession. The House began this effort some time ago, albeit slowly. Efforts began in 1991 to get the Finance Office to submit its budget on the basis of cost centers. And the IG began a process of review and analysis of audit sites and formulated an audit plan last year. All this was begun at a time when the House was cutting staff and reducing expenditures, and the IG had to depend largely upon GAO detailees. However, the Republican takeover of the House has dramatically accelerated this process, and that is why we're here today. It's taken six months to get to this point, but I think we're all very pleased that we're on the road to modernization. Chairman Thomas and the Republican leadership deserve a great deal of credit for accelerating the process. It was by a nearly unanimous vote on opening day that Republicans and Democrats joined together to bring the IG and Price Waterhouse 
to the table today with their suggestions. With our business operations out of sync with the executive branch and the private sector, the membership decided that it was time for a change, and 430 members agreed in a bipartisan spirit to authorize the expenditure of funds necessary to accelerate the audit process. I understand that there was full cooperation among Republican and Democratic members and by the House staff generally in providing information necessary for the IG and Price Waterhouse to conduct the audit and to formulate the recommendations. I think this bipartisan cooperation is in the best interest of the House and the American people. The audit's findings are the basis for the IG's recommendations for change. As a matter of fact, this audit provides the springboard upon which the House can move to a more modern level of business management. However, some people will undoubtedly dwell upon the findings simply as a criticism of past practices. To the extent that such criticism diverts the attention of the House or delays implementation of the recommendations of the audit, it will be doing a disservice to the House and the public. With the completion of this first overall financial picture of the House, its assets, income, and cash flow, the House is beginning a yearly audit process. This process will begin on an imperfect initial footing because we're converting from one type of accounting system to another, and the conversion leaves a lot of room for error, despite the best efforts of Price Waterhouse. In the coming years, the certainty of the financial statements will increase, and the public and members will all have a better understanding and a clearer picture of the financial processes in the House. I want to emphasize that the IG's and Price Waterhouse's presentation today is not an end point. It's the beginning of a process. There is no quick fix here. When an entity as large and complex as the House changes accounting systems, it will take some time to implement. In fact, as of today, I'm told there are only two out of 23 executive branch agencies, that's the GSA and the National Science Foundation, which have received unqualified opinions on their financial statements in accordance with the 1990 Chief Financial Officers Act. I expect to see the IG later this year or at the beginning of next year describing deficiencies he's found in the House's new operating system, suggesting ways to improve. So again, this report today is not an end point, but a beginning of a process that will go on into the future. Another consideration is that whenever you examine something closely enough, you find the need for further study. Having completed the initial review of many of the House's business operations, I expect the IG to propose further review, either by his office, the independent accounting firm, or other authority, such as this committee. When you peel back the operational layers of any business process for the first time, you often have to look further to get a full understanding of what you're seeing. So I expect that many of the IG's findings, some of which are preliminary or incomplete, will be followed up by the IG or other competent authority to determine what actions, if any, are necessary. As the House proceeds with the modernization of its business operations, Democrats want to join hands with Republicans and proceed on a bipartisan basis to fix the problems identified by the audits. The audits were independently conducted and the suggestions for change are in the interests of all House members of all parties. Working on a bipartisan basis will also serve the American taxpayer because there will be checks in place to provide balance and setting policy for the internal operations of the House. Our goal should be to provide for 100 percent public accountability for the funds we spend. And to do that, we <coughs> must have a picture of the House business practices which fully, fairly, and accurately shows us and the public where we're coming from. Only when we have command of these processes and the precise information necessary to make informed judgments will we be in the best possible pos position to efficiently manage our resources to serve the country and our constituents. We need to aggressively follow the recommendations proposed by the IG and fix any identified shortcomings in our business operations. Only by moving deliberately and yet as promptly as possible can we rebuild public trust in the House? Members were elected to carry out their constitutional role, not run a business. But to carry out this role, members need information, equipment, and staff resources, which should be 100 percent accountable to the American taxpayer. The changes proposed by the IG and Price Waterhouse should be reviewed and implemented with dispatch so can, we can all get on with the public policy setting role we were elected to perform. 
I believe that the House has already taken many of the steps recommended in the audits and will soon complete many more of them. Our intention should be positive. Let's implement these changes and constantly check our business operations against both public and private sector standards. With the results of the audit before us and with its many recommendations, the future is now. So I thank you for your efforts in learning about and analyzing the operations of the House and for your recommendations for change. I assume that as with any process of change, we'll be hearing from you again later this year, next year, with still another and another set of findings and recommendations. And who knows, maybe eventually the Senate might even follow. We do appreciate the fact that this institution is willing to look internally, and with your help, we get to the business of doing that today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. I waited 16 and a half years to hear a statement like that from a Democrat, and I appreciate very much the way in which you delivered it. Uh, any member, any other member who has any uh, comments, uh, we would ask that you uh, submit the written comments for the record. Um, <clears throat> the process that we will follow uh, is for uh, the next hour, uh, we will have an overview of the audit results uh, from the Inspector General, a uh, financial uh, operational audit overview from Tom Craren uh, from Price Waterhouse, and then we'll have a round of questions uh, by the members, uh, strictly controlled, five minutes each, and if we have an opportunity for a second round within that hour time frame, uh, we of course will do so. I do want to mention the fact that we're joined here uh, by one of our uh, colleagues uh, who is a freshman, Sam Brownback, uh, who uh, came to the 104th Congress and one of his first votes was uh, for uh, the independent audit and has been a very strong uh, spokesperson uh, for uh, that independent audit. And, uh, he wants to be here uh, as we unveil that audit. It's a pleasure. Uh, to have you here sitting with another freshman on this committee representing uh, one of the prime uh, moving groups for the change that has uh, come before us. Uh, let me introduce John Lanehart, who is the Inspector General of the House of Representatives. Mr. Lanehart was appointed in November of 1993. He was appointed to that position by the former majority with concurrence of the then minority and reappointed by the new majority with the concurrence of the now minority. It seems to me that from a political point of view, you couldn't get a better recommendation than that. He's joined by uh, Craig Silverthorne, who's the Director of uh, Contract Audit Services in the Office of the Inspector General. Uh, Tom Crerin is a partner in the firm of Price Waterhouse, uh, and he was in charge of uh, Price Waterhouse's uh, uh, effort uh, in this regard under contract to the Inspector General. Uh, John? Uh, we're looking forward to finding out what's between these multiple covers. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Chairman Thomas, ranking my minority member Fazio, and members of the committee. It is with a tremendous amount of pride that I appear before you today as the first Inspector General of the House of Representatives presenting the first ever comprehensive audit of the House of Representatives. John, uh, these mics are very unidirectional, and you need to pull that. I know you have a voluminous amount of material in front of you, but try to get as direct as you can so that uh, folks can hear you. This is important. Thank you. This audit was comprehensive in that it included the first ever audit of the financial statements of the House, and also 21 performance audits addressing each of the House's administrative operations including very significant audits of the House's information systems environment. Before I begin, I would like to thank the chairman and ranking minority member uh, for their support and encouragement as we went through this audit and single out a couple of the key staff members that have been uh, very supportive and, and working with us throughout this audit. Stacy Carlson, the majority staff director, Tom Jerkovich, who's the minority staff director, Otto Wolf, the majority professional staff, and Perry Pacros, uh, the minority professional staff. Uh, we worked as a, a very much as a team on a bipartisan basis, and I appreciate their support throughout the audit. As has already been mentioned, with the opening of the 104th Congress, I was given additional authorities. I was given the authority to perform financial and administrative office audits of all House administrative operations. I was also given additional staff. Uh, from the three staff that I had uh, previously, I was given 18 permanent positions. 
And of course, on the first day of the uh, new Congress with Section 107 of House Resolution 6, uh, I was given the authority to perform this audit. The audit, again, was to look at both the financial records and the administrative operations of the entire House. I was directed in that uh, resolution to contract with the CPA firm, public accounting firm, and uh, on January the 11th, I proposed to this committee, using a general accounting office task order, uh, to expeditiously go out and do the procurement. Uh, this GAO task order had already been competitively bid. There were five firms uh, that were on the contract. On January the 24th, we sent out task orders describing the scope of the work and informing them that we had to have all the responses back by February the 7th. On February the 10th, I informed the committee of the decision to select Price Waterhouse uh, to, to perform the entire audit. On February the 17th, Price Waterhouse <coughs> began work. Thus, in, in just five months, with as many as 125 Price Waterhouse professionals participating throughout the project, and within, at least we believe it's within, the $3.2 million original contract, uh, this audit has been completed, looking at the financial and administrative operations in their entirety. And we're here today to appear before you to give the results of that audit. First, I would like to emphasize that this was a totally nonpartisan effort. It was performed without any pressures, biases whatsoever. And it was conducted in a totally professional manner, following government auditing standards issued by the Controller General of the United States. We had bipartisan support throughout the audit. Furthermore, there were no constraints or limitations placed on us in performing our audits. However, as we will discuss in detail, we were hampered in performing our audit work due to the deficiencies in the House's accounting and reporting <coughs> systems, information systems, and the total internal controls environment. The Price Waterhouse audit consisted of the financial statement audits and 10 performance audits. The specific areas audited were financial operations, sales operations, inventory systems, accounts payable systems, contract administration, office level financial management, office level short and long range planning, office level computer security, house information systems, and a proposed new accounting system called the financial management system. The audits covered a 15 month period from October 1, 93 to December 31st, 1994. In addition, the Office of the Inspector General performed three audits using in-house staff. We looked at internal controls issues related to member services, the house beauty shop, and the house gift shop. Today, I have issued the financial statements audit report and 21 performance audit reports, as identified in the graphic that's up here on my left. Small print, but in my handouts, the uh, details. These audits were conducted by Price Waterhouse staff, 18 of the 21, and by Office of Inspector General staff, 3 of the 21. In addition to the detailed audit reports, I've issued a compilation of the performance audits, the ones done by Price Waterhouse, and two other <coughs> compilation reports. One contains an extract of the results in brief, and this includes the 21 performance audits and the other contains the findings and recommendations from our 21 performance audits and the financial statement audit report. Hopefully these will break down the so many inches of uh, material into a little bit more manageable size, to give summaries of the information that we presented. In total, these reports identify and discuss in detail 14 material internal control weaknesses identified <coughs> the performance of the financial statement <coughs> audit, 81 findings of deficiencies in total, and 226 recommendations for corrective action. With the respect to the recommendations, we identified opportunities to achieve almost 11.7 million in cost savings 
and unnecessary costs totaling almost $9.3 million, $4.3 million of which can still be avoided in the future. Unfortunately, $5 million was spent on a, uh, a computer system that we recommended uh, no longer be pursued, and so that $5 million has been lost. Needless to say, these are fairly significant findings and recommendations. But even more significant is the issue that, for the first time, the House's entire operations have been comprehensively audited. We identified very significant operational problems, both financial and, uh, and administrative, and recommendations for corrective actions have been made and agreed to by management. These actions, some of which have already been taken, some of which are in the process of being taken, and others are planned, and the plans are in, in the process of being implemented. Our findings can be categorized into five overriding deficiencies. First, the House lacked financial accountability. Second, significant waste occurred. Third, the House's internal controls environment was weak. Fourth, significant computer security weaknesses existed. And finally, we identified many operational improvements that were needed. I'm going to discuss each of these very briefly, and then Tom Cran will get into some more details uh, to add to that. The first area, the House lacked financial accountability. The House had never been subjected to an audit. It had never prepared consolidated financial statements, and it never evaluated itself against external standards and benchmarks. Furthermore, it had never been subjected to public scrutiny. The House lacked the organization and structure to periodically prepare financial statements. And even after significant adjustments by Price Waterhouse and reconstructions of events, we really weren't able to develop accurate and reliable information. In addition, the method of accounting underlying the preparation of the financial management information was simplistic and ill-suited for an organization the size of the House. Furthermore, outdated and poorly designed computer systems contributed to the House's general lack of financial information in preparing financial statements and managing its operations. The primary automated system that the House uses is over 20 years old, or nearly 20 years old. It was designed only to record cash activities similar to an automated checkbook. In addition, the deficiencies in the accounting, reporting, and financial systems that we identified uh, were, were made even worse because of internal control structure deficiencies. The House had policies and procedures documented in the Congressional Handbook, but they were frequently waived or were ineffective as a means of maintaining proper control over transactions. As a result of the weaknesses identified by Price Waterhouse, they were unable to render an opinion on the House's financial statements. Furthermore, for a legislative body such as the House, financial accountability over administrative functions is best achieved through periodic reporting on the performance to the public. Members and administrative management of the House must be provided with the necessary tools, such as modern technology, that produces reliable and useful information. We need this to make informed decisions, to balance quality with the goods and services that they're paying for. In the case of the House, however, no means was available through which financial performance could be measured and comprehensively reported. On occasion, we believe this led to poor decision making, which in turn resulted in unnecessary costs and opportunities for savings. Mechanisms were not in place to encourage members and administrative management to acquire and use goods and services with economy and efficiency. The House generally erred on the side of providing its members with the services they wanted without due regard for costs. Administrative offices were staffed to meet peak workloads. Furthermore, the true costs associated with, with providing these services to members were obscured. Compared to other government agencies and private sector organizations, many House services are inefficient and expensive. 
Because the House did not routinely compare its cost to benchmarks, it did not identify opportunities to eliminate excess costs and inefficiencies. Thus, we identified major inefficient practices performed by numerous administrative offices, which provide opportunities for almost $11.7 million in annual savings. We also found instances where unnecessary costs totaling $9.3 million were being incurred for administrative functions. This is primarily a result of the members not having good financial information in order to uh, manage their offices. With respect to the internal controls environment, in, in general, the, the, in, the uh, controls environment was weak throughout all the House administrative operations. In the area of financial reporting, the House's financial reporting system was in concept just a large checkbook. It was limited to keeping a running balance on cash received and cash dispersed. The system also allocated costs inconsistently and incompletely, obscuring the true costs of providing support to members, committees, and other House offices. As a result, the House was limited in its ability to make informed decisions on the cost-effective use of resources and provide financial accountability to the public. Weak controls and enforcement of rules surrounding travel expenses resulted in some members, staff, and vendors being paid twice for the same travel expenses. The financial system was not programmed to detect duplicate vouchers if they were submitted two months prior. To compound the problem, the Committee on House Administration waived compliance with some of the rules on timely submission, inclusion of original receipts, or both. We identified numerous general and application control weaknesses in the member services area. We identified data integrity controls which were inadequate, ina excuse me, inadequate ensure the completeness, accuracy, and consistency of the data in the member's payroll system. We found that software maintenance programs had not been established for upgrading the microcomputer uh, that it was being processed on and the payroll software. Hardware operations and application programming and security administration, uh, there were separation of duties problems in that area. We also identified unauthorized copies of software being utilized uh, to process the member's payroll. Further, member services redundantly process payroll on microcomputers in addition to the mini computer as a check on payroll processing. And member services cost five times more than they should have to process members' payroll. Regarding budgeting, the House's weak internal controls over spending and poor financial information concerning budget execution resulted in members expending $14.2 million more than they were appropriated for their allowances. And at the end of the fiscal year, the House had to reprogram $11.6 million from other fiscal year 94 appropriations and $2.6 million from unused prior year appropriations. The House Beauty Shop did not establish budgetary and financial controls, establish effective cash management controls, and adequately safeguard information systems. The House Beauty Shop also did not comply with an existing statute dealing with the payment of bills for supplies of the, of the barber shop. And the list goes on. Significant computer security weaknesses also existed. The House information resources at both the office level and HIS were not adequately protected to ensure integrity, confidentiality, and availability of the House's hardware, software, and information. As a result, members' computer systems were vulnerable to access, exposing the information on their systems to disclosure, manipulation, and or destruction. Mm -hmm. Information on the House's computer systems was vulnerable to tam tampering and destruct destruction by unauthorized users within the House or from hackers from outside. The House had too, information, too few information security staff. The existing information security staff focused their efforts on protecting the mainframe. They weren't 
spending time looking at the office level security. The House had inadequate disaster recovery plans for its mainframe, computer, for its telecommunication systems, and office level systems. In addition, the House did not adequately uh, perform security checks on personnel having access to sensitive information. Although the risk from inadequate or uh, inadequacies in, in computer security really aren't quantifiable, they are significant. For example, the members' computer systems could be penetrated, confidential, confidential information contained on them could be obtained, modified, or destroyed. Inadequate disaster recovery plans could result in all data being lost and information having to be reconstructed from paper files at a great cost. Many operational improvements were also needed. Strategic planning, top management involvement and oversight, appropriate organizational structures, and performance measurement were not evident in the House's functions. For example, in the financial management area, we found that the House lacked a formal strategic planning and performance measurement process to coordinate short and long-range planning by all administrative offices. In addition, the House lacked an integrated financial management process, which included planning, budgeting, and financial accounting and related procedures to support effective management. Regarding information resources management, the House lacked leadership and oversight over the application of information technology. Housewide goals and technology strategies were never established to meet common member requirements. In addition, the HIS organizational structure had multiple groups performing, performing similar functions, resulting in organizational redundancies and inefficient use of resources. Furthermore, computer systems produced by HIS we're not following a structured systems development process, and duplicative systems were being developed, ones that competed with vendors' uh, existing systems. With respect to the human resources area, personnel management practices were inconsistent. House personnel files contained limited and random information. The House Committee on Administration did not develop uniform policy direction and guidance for House officers or require that personnel documentation be kept in a centralized location. In addition, personnel files contain inadequate documentation to indicate the basis for pay increases. Without this documentation, payroll increase justifications totaling $563,000 paid during the audit period were unclear. Leave records were also missing. And finally, regarding the procurement process, we found that the House had no central procurement process or office responsible for monitoring procurement activities. There was very little or limited planning in, procurement, in the procurement areas. The House did not adequately monitor or control source, sole source procurements and did not monitor and enforce vendor performance. As a result, the House was subject, subjected to risk such as those dealing with administrative offices following inconsistent procurement policies and procedures. Sound procurement decisions may have been inhibited. Full and open competition for procured items may not have been achieved. Items may have been purchased in excess of market or competitive prices. And goods and services may have been procured that were below expectations set forth in the specifications or vendor agreements. In conclusion, the House's accounting policies, methods, and financial management system did not meet routine financial management standards, those standards followed by, the private, by private industry or other federal agencies. The automated systems were duplicated by manual systems in order to ensure accuracy, were therefore redundant and paper intensive. Thus, we found that the House's financial operations were archaic and the information produced were un was unreliable, and as such, was not really serving the needs of the members. The administrative operations were also deficient. Administrative op offices generally erred on the side of providing members with the services they wanted without due regard for economy. They were staffed to meet peak workloads, 
the true cost associated with providing services to the members was obscured. Further, members' computer systems were vulnerable to access, exposing the information on the systems, disclosure, manipulation, and or destruction. Many corrective actions have already been taken, and the House officers are to be commended for their prompt attention to the matters that we disclosed in our reports. This is especially true in the administrative operations areas. However, putting the House's financial operations in order will take a considerable amount of time. Implementing a new financial management system that meets generally accepted federal accounting requirements, which is already in process, is a good first step but much more is needed. One thing is virtually certain. It may take several years before the House will be able to achieve a clean, unqualified opinion on an audit of its financial statements. This is true because the current state of the financial systems are such that, that a total overhaul of the system is really needed. There are no quick fixes. Much work is needed to bring the House into the modern age of financial management. However, the Office of Inspector General is committed to help bring about this transformation. and We look forward to continuing to perform quality audits, such as those discussed, that contribute to improving the House's financial and administrative operations. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, uh, John. Tom, uh, uh, as someone who is in the business of doing this on a daily basis uh, and has seen both private uh, and government uh, operations audited. Can you give us uh, what we have here from your perspective? Uh, this is among the weakest I've seen. Uh, I did I did HUD when they had all of its, its problems. At least they were on an accrual basis. Uh, I don't think the House's Office of Finance did the members uh, a good service. I think they did not give them the fundamental tools to do their jobs and did not present the finances of the House in any comprehensive manner. So it's, uh, we disclaimed an opinion, as you know. That's very rare for an auditing organization to do that. And it, it speaks uh, very severely for the improvements that are necessary in the House. And do you have any comments in general that you might want to offer to us based upon uh, your company's audit? I do. I, have, I can summarize some remarks for you. I know time is short. No, no, no. You go ahead. I would like to hear at least some general statement from you, Tom. I'll be happy to do that. We're, again, we're pleased to be here as well. And I uh, want to echo the thanks to your staff and, and to the Chief Administrative Officer's staff and the Sergeant at Arms and the Clerk. We had 120 auditors rain down on them. And we appreciate their patience and cooperation. Um, one of the most powerful controls you put in, Mr. Chairman, is public accountability. And when an organization periodically makes available for public dissemination information about all of its finances and how it conducts its financial operations, as the House has done through this audit, there is a strong inducement to improve financial reporting and internal controls. And we suspect that with ongoing public accountability, our concerns about internal control weaknesses and ongoing compliance with House rules and requirements will be quickly addressed and resolved. That's the key. Um, again, I discussed our disclaimer of opinion. To put that into context and to give you a goal to shoot for is you'll notice most, most corporations have a one-page report from their auditor, uh, which in essence is a call to clean opinion, unqualified opinion. That's the expectation. I think you should shoot for that as soon as you can. Even state and local governments, like the district, uh, need to have a cool base statement. They need to access the capital markets. Um, so the capital markets demand that they have a clean opinion, that they have accrual-based statements. Um, since the government has typically has, the federal government typically has easier access to money, there's not always as much emphasis on that as there should be. And that's not just in the House, that's in the executive branch. But we noticed it here as well. Uh, again, uh, as John indicated, the House has, its financial records are in very poor shape. We brought an exhibit here of a ledger card uh, which for a $700 million operation, you can see, is very simplistic. That was one of the basic records in the Office of Finance. And if you have trouble making heads or tails of it, we did too. Perhaps you could turn that around so those in the audience at least get to see what uh, we worked off of.
Could you identify the number in the lower right-hand corner? What that is, is that? as near as we can tell, 234 million. One hundred and fourteen thousand seven hundred and forty three dollars uh, crossed out a couple of times, but that's until it. they got it right, quote unquote. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. If it is right. Uh, the House also did have, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, an automated system known as the financial management system, uh, which was uh, a mirror system in a sense. It helped it was mainly used to produce the clerk's report and to give the members the means to manage one of their allowances. Uh, but as Mr. Lanehart indicated, it was a, it's nearly 20 years old, and we think it contributed to a number of the shortcomings that we've mentioned, uh, including the budget overrun. Uh, we found certain members uh, exceeded their allowances. We think the poor systems contributed to that. Uh, we found that members were making unnecessary lease and maintenance payments on equipment that was clearly old and outdated. Uh, a modern system would have alerted them to that and would have prompted them to either justify the payment or stop making it. It also contributed to duplicate payments. Uh, as we've mentioned, uh, any good system should prompt you when you're going to, when a, there's a duplicate, when there's evidence of a duplicate before payment is made. It's not a good control to try and fix it after the fact. Uh, also, the, the previous financial statements and the way the House reported its operations uh, were not comprehensive. You had the report of the clerk, which listed over 90,000 disbursements, but really didn't summarize them or put them in any context, context. And you had a lot of individual reports on the beauty shop and the barber shop and the recording studio, but those were just small components of the House. So uh, I think we're strongly recommending you, co you continue with a comprehensive financial statement, uh, which is where we're going towards now. Uh, again, the cash basis uh, accounting uh, should be done away with. You should go to an accrual-based accounting. That will improve your control over the use of your budget. Um, it generally gives you information sooner, well before you pay cash, and therefore would allow you to take action if you were approaching your budget limitation. Uh, also, as we've mentioned here, it's been mandated that accrual accounting and annual financial statements in an annual report uh, be prepared by executive branch departments and agencies uh, pursuant to the Chief Financial Officers Act that was passed in 1990. Uh, we also recommend that the House apply that act to themselves. That also, by the way, mandates an audit of that annual report and financial statement. Um, as part of our audit, we did look at internal controls and we did find a number of weaknesses, some of which have been mentioned and I won't repeat. Um, I'll mention some that, that I don't think haven't been brought out yet. Uh, we found weak controls and enforcement of rules surrounding travel expenses, um, resulting in charge card vendors and some members and staff being paid twice for travel costs. Controls over amounts due on charge cards were not always effective and caused many members and house employees to be late in paying their charge card bills. In some cases, charge cards were consistently passed due by over 120 days. Payroll policy and late submission of payroll documents created unnecessary manual processing and caused 299,000 of payroll overpayments. Uh, all of, while all but 13,000 of this has subsequently been recovered, controls should have been in place to prevent, prevent them from occurring in the first place. Controls over mask mailings also require improvement. Under present conditions, it is possible to circumvent the Franken Commission approval for certain mailings, especially if they're done in the district offices. And this is becoming a bigger concern because technology is allowing uh, mass mailings using uh, personal computers. Uh, when it was run by the House, the catering operations had little or no control over amounts it may have been owed for catering services. There were few or no records remaining with regard to how and when catering services were used and how much the House still may be owed for providing this service. The Committee on House Administration, as was mentioned, routinely granted exceptions to House rules, undermining the effectiveness of those rules as control mechanisms. For example, the Committee denied only 3% of more than 1,000 requests to buy equipment not on the House approved list. This greatly diminished the effectiveness of a qualified vendor's list. Also, about 7% of travel costs, or $900,000, were paid on vouchers for which the committee granted exceptions to House rules. 
Another issue we looked at, which you look at in any government audit, is compliance with the Congressional Handbook, with laws and regulations applicable to the institution. And we did find potential instances of noncompliance, which we will refer to the Committee on House Oversight for further investigation. Uh, now, the reason an audit won't typically draw these to conclusion is because they do require more investigative work. And I'll summarize those referrals to you. Office of Finance records indicate that certain members overspent one or more of their allowances for staff salaries, office expenses, or official mail, or received adjustments to their allowances that did not appear to be adequately supported. The Congressional Handbook states that members are personally liable for the amounts by which they overspend their allowances. We also noted instances where members' 1994 disclosure forms did not disclose certain debts that came to our attention during the audit. There were instances where neither the Office of Finance nor members' offices retained certificates of relationship, non-relationship, to any current member of Congress, which the Congressional Handbook requires each House employee to complete when hired. <coughs> to the extent we identify duplicate payments to members or House employees that have not been repaid, we also intend to submit pertinent information to the Committee on House Oversight for further investigation. Other potential areas of noncompliance, including the improper use of credit cards and late submission of documents, will also be included in our referral. Now, moving to the, I'd like to move to the performance audits. Uh, again, uh, the major findings there is we found instances of uh, what we've labeled excess costs of 9.3 million. We've summarized them here for you. The first one was the cost of designing a computer system that did not meet house needs. That's the five million Mr. Lanehart mentioned. Uh, cost and maintenance of leased fees for outdated equipment. Again, as I mentioned earlier, you're paying leases on equipment. In some cases, it's 10 or 15 years old. Uh, payments du uh, for duplicate services, tasks, te and technologies, and overpayments in employee salaries and benefits. Uh, we also, again, found that services were not cost effective. And uh, according to the results of a, of a customer satisfaction survey, which we conducted, as you know, in March 1995, with only a few exceptions, members and house employees were generally satisfied with the services they provided, with a couple of important exceptions, the House the Office of Finance being one. Um, but how efficiently and economically those services were purchased uh, the, our survey was much more mixed. And as you see here, uh, we found a number of instances where there are opportunities to acquire the same or similar services at a lower cost. And again, as was mentioned, that's quite predominantly because employees are hired for peak workloads. That's the fixed cost and the variable workload issue. Uh, some of the wages that are being uh, paid are higher than they are in the private sector for a similar job responsibility. Uh, we have some payments for unnecessary services. This is, for example, for excess, for warehouse space you don't need, or for maintaining too much inventory. And then charging less than the cost, uh, the full cost of, of goods and services. Again, an example might be the flags. In this case. Again, I, I'll be happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. I want to echo one thing the Inspector General said, that is that uh, it will take some time for you to get uh, achieve a clean opinion. I think next year will be exceedingly difficult, 1995. I think uh, you're targeting implementing your new uh, financial management system F called FFS for 96, so that may be the earliest time you'll be able to get some sort of a uh, statement from an auditor other than a disclaimer of opinion. We'll be happy to answer any questions you might have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Curran, but if you never start, you can never get there. And uh, what you provided us with was uh, a, a hoped-for baseline uh, that would allow us uh, to move forward. Uh, as we've seen, it perhaps um, examined a system that was so poorly structured, so inaccurate, so unreliable, uh, that we may have to do uh, some additional work in order to get that solid baseline to go forward. You also said that uh, public accountability uh, is perhaps uh, the best way to keep us moving. I believe sunshine is a very strong antiseptic, 
And I can assure you that as long as we're in the majority, what we started on the first day of this Congress will be carried out uh, in each subsequent uh, Congress uh, so that uh, the people know exactly what's going on. Um, my concern goes to the uh, statements that you made uh, in regard to your um, complete inability to provide us with firm answers about the finance system, uh, not only in regard to the larger question of uh, purchases of equipment and other items, but also to the uh, ability to resolve some of the member uh, account problems. Uh, I was very much concerned about uh, the exception process in previous Congresses, and that's why when I became chairman, the very first rule I instituted was no exceptions. Uh, although the handbook is not as clear as we would like it to be, uh, clearly we're working on a new handbook in a bipartisan way. Uh, the no exception rule, I thought, was essential uh, as an operating uh, procedure until we got uh, a new handbook. And uh, I, I feel somewhat vindicated by that, uh, clearly given uh, the review of exceptions that you were able to see. As a member of the minority, we were never able to be fully provided with the scope and amount of the exceptions provided by uh, the former chairman of the committee. Uh, I would like to um, um, enter into a little bit of a colloquy, uh, John, with you. My concern is, given the information that we've received uh, from Price Waterhouse, uh, and Tom indicated that he was going to provide the committee with information which might in fact be uh, names of members and some discrepancies in the record. Uh, I want you to know that on a bipartisan basis, uh, the leadership of the House as an institution felt that it was probably inappropriate since you've just described a system that doesn't allow us to make any final determination to submit it to uh, this committee. That in fact, Tom, we're asking you to transmit that information and later tonight a resolution will be passed by the House to so indicate that that information should be provided to the Inspector General uh, and the resolution uh, will allow the Inspector General to go forward uh, to finally uh, reconcile the records that you folks were unable to in the time frame uh, and with the information that you had. Uh, but John, just to lay the groundwork for that, uh, has any of the information, including documentation or names of individuals, uh, been shared with anyone on the committee, the committee staff, or people outside? No, none of the information has been shared with anybody on the committee or any staff. And in fact, I haven't even seen it myself. And Tom, is that your understanding of the material that you have generated as well? Yes. And that you will then uh, submit it to Tom with the, uh, John with the understanding that uh, this information is not available uh, to anyone. Um, in either of your opinions, what basically is the uh, substance uh, of this. It sounds to me like you've described a system uh, which failed the members. Uh, were you able to reach any conclusions at all about uh, any, with any specificity uh, about members interacting with the system? Uh, I, th that's our correct, that's correct, that's our view of it, is that the information provided predominantly by the Office of Finance we thought was insufficient to alert members if they were approaching allowance limits. And to give you an example, each of the three allowances, official expenses, clerk hire, and uh, mailing, has its own system. And, and in fact, the mail allowance is controlled by the Postal Service. You have a Macintosh that's used on the, for the clerk hire and then FMS predominantly for official expenses. So you're setting up, uh, it's almost a setting yourself up to misspend in a convoluted, unintegrated environment like that. Uh, given the information as described by uh, Price Waterhouse, uh, Mr. Lanehart, uh, could you give us some general idea of how you may propose to uh, proceed to try to resolve these questions? Well, I think one of the most important things is that it be resolved as quickly as possible so we get everything out in the open. And I, I think you'll find no objection at all from uh, didn't think so. From the members. Um, so again, I, because of that, I would take advantage of the GAO uh, task order contract and go back in and, and try to contract for the additional audit help. Uh, and you're getting into an area that's 
being titled uh, uh, forensic auditing, we actually get into much more detail than the normal financial statement auditor would get into. I think we need to get that kind of help. Probably uh, off the top of my head, uh, I would like to see some of the resolution occur as the time goes on, but I would think in total three to four months to uh, complete the work. Uh, we anticipate putting uh, in the resolution a November 30th, if not sooner, mm -hmm. uh, date to allow you, and we, on a bipartisan basis, intend to provide you with reasonable resources, <laughs> uh, not open-ended, uh, to try to get the job done. Does that sound like a reasonable <coughs> time frame uh, for you to resolve the, whatever it is that Price Waterhouse is going to provide you with? I think that's reasonable, yes, sir. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, let me just say a couple of things uh, in response, in part, to some <coughs> of the Chairman's comments. I agree with this policy of no exceptions uh, and the review of the handbook. Uh, Mr. Thomas, having been a ranking member of this committee in its uh, former life, uh, I think struggled appropriately with the need to keep these exceptions uh, equitable and fair to both parties, but I think he's right on target when he says we ought not to make them and certainly that's been my policy since I've been here and I certainly hope this handbook can be written in a way that will make these questions uh, really unnecessary in the first place because I think that uh, is something that um, we can do a much better job of guiding the members with. Uh, secondly, I think there is no doubt that we've made a decision to go down this road and it isn't a partisan decision. It's we've made very clear. It, it won't matter who, frankly, is in the majority here or the minority for that matter. This is an irreversible decision to do annual audits and I will personally fight if my party is to take back control of this institution to make sure this process is not deviated from in any sense whatsoever. And I just want to underscore the last comment that he made. We would need to move as fast as we can possibly move and I would hope that we would underscore as soon as possible rather than the date. It's, it's a matter of resources, I realize, dollars and people, but I think in order to do this in the proper manner, to get the information uh, from the IG and to the Ethics Committee if that's appropriate, we need to move with as great a speed as we can without in any way undermining the work product because I think we are attempting for the first time in a bipartisan sense to manage this in a way that's both fair to the individuals who may be involved and also to the public that demands accountability. We cannot wait very long. Uh, there will be, I'm sure, a certain amount of immediate pressure which hopefully we can uh, resist so that this process that this resolution will lay out can be followed. Uh, John, do you want to comment on what you think is accomplishable and what it will take to do this job? Well, as I mentioned, with the resources that I have, um, I think the best approach would be to go and get some additional resources through uh, contracting through the GEO task order. Um, I think, just as we saw here, Price Waterhouse was able to, able to bring 125 people on board in a four-month period spending almost uh, a little bit over 40,000 uh, uh, days of effort. I think that's important to try to throw, uh, you know, the resources at this. It makes no sense to go out and start again. We obviously no. can continue our work with Price Waterhouse, cut down hopefully a lot of time, and bring to bear the people who have some understanding of what they're doing. Is that your intention? That's my intention, yes, sir. I, I certainly want you to have the clear impression that it is the bipartisan will of this committee that you extend in effect this contract or adjust it for its new purpose. Yes, sir. Can I ask uh, Tom perhaps to, to comment on how long it takes normally in the executive branch to achieve an unqualified opinion? I said earlier that there are only two of 23 that had a unqualified opinion. Um, you might argue around the margins of that, but in general uh, what do you see? I, you indicated earlier you thought it couldn't be done in a year, but how do you see us proceeding if you were to use the executive branch as an analogous entity? 
Uh, I'm not sure I'd use the executive branch as a as a benchmark on that. It's taken some in some cases uh, five or six years for those that tried to audit have audits before the CFO Act was passed. They've moved much much too slowly, in my view, Ms. Uh, Mr. Fazio. Um, I would recommend uh, doing it faster. Like I said, the benchmark ought to be the same as it is for state and local governments who need to do that to access the capital markets. And I, I think you should strive for a year or two. And that's, that's a push. And it's probably a sizable investment. But uh, I think it's an investment that's probably <coughs> worthwhile. One last question. Um, I know there were concerns about these 2,200 duplicative payments on vouchers. I'm wondering if, if uh, you could give us some impression as to how this problem would compare to other government agencies or the private sector people you've looked at. It's four-tenths of one percent of all that we process, but any number is obviously going to be a concern. I think the main uh, issue there is that it, it just shouldn't happen. It's a simple thing that a modern financial management system can stop. And it, it, will, it will prompt somebody, for example, to look at something where the dollar amounts are the same and stop them and say, check this before you cut a check. And so I think it was mainly a function, again, of your, of your uh, very outdated financial management structure. Well, I agree with that. Do you have any uh, information that would compare it to the kind of uh, system that may be operating in other entities that are similar or that you've audited, perhaps? Uh, you, I, I have not, in my experience, seen that many duplicates. Four-tenths um, of one percent is high. Well, just in, in terms of the sheer 2,200, it's, that's a fairly high number. You always see some, you, but I've never seen in the thousands. You see, you, know, you typically find uh, some exceptions, but, but not of that magnitude. I mean, even, even four tenths of, a, of one percent, as you cite, is too high, in a sense, for something that could be that easily caught. And it's a, it's a comparatively simple control that, that can and should be in place. Well, I understand, and we certainly hope to implement that system. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, the committee will stand in recess while we vote on this and possible following votes. Uh, following the conclusion of this round of voting, the chair will ask uh, Mr. Ehlers, the vice chair, uh, to take over the chair. And any members who have questions that they would like to ask of this team, and I would ask that the gentlemen remain, uh, we can certainly do so following the votes. Uh, committee stands uh, in recess. We'll return to this hearing in a moment, but first a look at some weekend programming. This weekend on C-SPAN 2, the first three days of the Waco...